Hey folks, Dave Nodding, Financial Futurist here at Vetify. Thanks to Spark Network and Daisy, I had the unbelievable opportunity to interview Professor Stuart Russell from Berkeley, California, who's the author of Human Compatible, and one of the leading voices calling for some form of AI regulation, some form of governmental response. I tried to cut this down, it's about an hour long. We hit everything from the amount of capital flowing into AI, how large language models work and don't work, where the control concerns are, really in things like industrial applications, military applications. We talk about where the money's flowing. We talk about what people should actually do about all of this technology that's landing in our laps. It was one of the most fascinating conversations I've had in a long time. I hope you enjoy it. Cheers. I thought it would be great if you could start to sort of Giving us an update on your thesis, the world of AI seems to be changing so quickly that the fact that I heard you say it two weeks ago means it could be completely different now. <laughs> right, so for those of you who did the homework, this is gonna be repetition. Um, but you know, we've been doing AI for 75 years or so. Um, and the, uh, the goal since the beginning has been to make machines whose actions can be expected to achieve their objectives, right? And this is, the, this is the basic notion of intelligence that we borrowed from philosophy, from economics uh, in the middle of the last century. Uh, this concept of ration, rational behavior. Uh, and that's what we built for, uh, for most of the history of the field. Um, and so my work in the last decade or so has been to try to undo that um, because it's fundamentally a mistake. If you build systems that way, uh, whether it's a chess program or you know, a, a reinforcement learning system that learns how to drive a car, you have to specify the objectives uh, and then those objectives become completely fixed within the system. That becomes its raison d'etre, um, and if you get that wrong, uh, then you're setting up uh, a conflict, right? Then you've got systems that are pursuing an objective that turns out not to be the right one. So this is what we call the King Midas problem. King Midas said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. He got that. The gods, in this case, uh, gave it to him. Uh, and then he realized that his food and his drink and his family all turned to gold, and, and this was a really bad idea, but it's too late. So, um, what's happened is that a fairly significant, but still small fraction of the AI community uh, agrees with this thesis and is trying to figure out how do we do it differently? Right? How do we make AI systems that are actually uh, going to be beneficial to us? We have to abandon this idea that uh, AI systems pursue fixed objectives that we give them up front. Uh, instead, they have one implicit objective, which is to be beneficial to humans, to bring about the future that humans want. But they know that they don't know what that is. And so part of their job is to learn from humans more about what we want the future to be like. Um, and in the absence of information, they're going to behave naturally cautiously, right? They're not gonna change the world in ways that they're not sure that we actually want them to change the world. So hopefully they will rescue little children who are about to be run over by a bus because they're pretty clear that we want that. Um, but they may not, uh, for example, uh, decide to um, fix climate change using a technology that sucks all the oxygen out of the atmosphere, even though that would be very effective, <laughs> because it would get rid of us, who are the problem, <laughs> right? So, I think most of us within this community felt that we had a few decades. I would, be, I would say I was on the more conservative end of timelines. Um, I tried to avoid publicly giving any number for when I thought uh, we would have superhuman AI systems. Um, but then I was at a 
uh, a meeting that was under Chatham House rules and somebody asked and I said, okay, well, since we're under Chatham House rules and this is completely off the record, I'll say, <laughs> well, okay, maybe in the lifetime of my children. And there was a Daily Telegraph journalist in the audience, so 20 minutes later, it's on the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Uh, professor says sociopathic robots to take over the world within a generation. <laughs> you saw that one. Yeah. So um, anyway, but I think everyone's timelines have moved up considerably. So um, really just in the last five years, language models have gone from being uh, a niche tool uh, that you know, helps speed up your typing on your cell phone. That's a language model that predicts what is, what's the next word going to be. Um, something that smooths out uh, machine translation outputs to make it more idiomatic and natural. Um, and something that does a, you know, a few percent improvement in speech recognition. Um, because if you can predict the next word, then even if you can't hear it properly, you can still make a guess about what it is. Um, so th those were the uses for language models. Nobody thought that if you make them bigger, they'll go from being you know, useful next word predictors to uh, convincing someone that they're sentient um, or con trying to convince someone to marry them. Right? There's just such a huge gap between how we thought of these systems and how they are now perceived. Um, and I would say they're not by themselves going to produce a real general purpose superhuman AI. So general purpose AI or AGI as it's sometimes called artificial general intelligence means AI systems that can do anything the human mind can do and probably do it better. I don't think uh, by scaling them up they will achieve that. They have serious limitations. For example, they cannot, uh, in a real sense, deliberate for an extended period about what to do. Um, because their computational structure, given an input, just processes that input in a fixed sequence of layers of the network uh, to produce that output. So they, it's whatever number of layers they have, let's say it might be a thousand, but you, so we can, they, they can do a thousand steps of computation and nothing more. Um, so that limits what they can do in terms of planning uh, and reasoning and inventing. But everyone and their uncle is trying to figure out, okay, well, how can we bypass these limitations, right? Can we use um, the output of the system as a kind of external memory because that feeds back in, right? The output of the system becomes part of the conversation that is fed back to the input, which then gives you a kind of recurrent structure, uh, which is capable of deliberation, so it can think to itself uh, over an extended period. What happens if we plug a hundred of these systems together so that they're all talking to each other, etc.? So basically everyone says, yeah, this is a piece of the puzzle of AGI. We don't exactly know which piece, and we don't know what other pieces we need, but everybody is trying to figure out the answers to those questions. So many of my colleagues in the AI safety community who used to think we had 40 or 50 years to solve this problem now think uh, we might have less than a decade. So that's, that's an update. update. That's sobering. Oh, <laughs> that's sobering. Um, is, the, is one of the things that changed here not just the release of large language models, but this idea, you talk about the, now we're looking back to a thousand tokens or a thousand steps and using that as effectively relevance realization for the conversation that we're in in a recurrent fashion, which is the same way cognitive scientists have been talking about how the human brain works right lately, this idea of recurrent relevance realization. Is there a chance that there are other steps coming from cognitive science that, that could just sort of surprise us the way this idea of, of looking backwards at the output as part of the input changed language models five years ago? I think what's going on in cognitive science is people are trying to take on board the success of the large language right. models and say, oh, of course, yeah, we understand how human cognition works now, uh, really looking at the success of, of the language models in generating human-like behavior. I mean, that could be a complete mistake, right? 
the language models are good at generating human-like behavior because they've been trained to imitate human-like behavior. <laughs> and they've been trained to do it on 30 trillion words of text, which is about the same amount as all the books the human race has ever written. So somewhere between 10,000 and a million times more text than any human has ever read. Right? So of course they're good at imitating human behavior, and the fact that they are does not mean that that's what humans must be doing. Right? Because clearly humans have done it from a million times less data, so they're doing right. something different. Right? If, you, if you take the amount of data that a human has, and you supply it to one of these systems, they are completely uh, illiterate. Right? They don't behave like humans, they can't answer any questions, uh, and they just output gibberish. So, actually, the evidence shows the opposite, that human cognition is something totally different from what's going on in these systems. And, and that doesn't seem to be largely a, a big topic of discussion in terms of like, like the consciousness of an AI. I think it bears like 20 pages total in your 12,000 page book. That doesn't seem to be a big part of the research because it's not about getting agents to do something in the world, which seems to be most of the work. Yeah, I would say, I mean, in the other book, Human Compatible, I say, I'm not gonna say anything about consciousness <laughs> in this book because we don't know anything and there's right. nothing we can do. End of story. So this is so, so it's nothing, yeah, so consciousness is, is only a discussion happening in the media. I was about to say, the media makes a lot out of this idea that you know, AIs are gonna get volition and decide to do things on their own for their own well-being. You're not concerned about that at all. You're, I, I'm guessing you're much more concerned about the control issue, just like you would be about an engineering plant of some sort. Yeah, so well, the word volition is ambiguous, right? So, and in fact, there are many words in AI that are ambiguous. When, when AI researchers say the s system is thinking or learning or understanding, you should view every one of those words as having little quote marks <laughs> around, right? And, it's not the same notion, so volition for an AI system isn't the same notion it is for a human, right, where we have a subjective experience of wanting something, uh, you know, that's, it can even be painful that we want something so much, right? Um, what it means for an AI system is that there's some internal goal structure which is causing the outputs, you know, which is uh, influencing what kinds of outputs are chosen by the system. And, and that goal structure is what we need to align for human benefit. So the goal structure is what we need to align. And the, there's, well, there's two big problems. One is we haven't the faintest idea what they are, right? So that's the other weird thing. This, these large language models are not designed. They're not programmed. Um, if you want a mental picture Think about, so they are, they're basically a circuit. So think about a chain link fence, right? You can all imagine a chain link fence. And each little link in that chain link fence is one of the tunable parameters of the system. Okay? And the algorithm just tunes the, the, that connection strength of that little link in the chain link fence uh, to try to get the whole circuit to be better at outputting words that look like the words that humans output. And now imagine, now that chain link fence is 50 miles by 50 miles, right? So it covers the entire, you know, New York region. Um, and where do you look for the goal, right? I mean, do you look for it in Manhattan or in Queens or where is it? You haven't the faintest idea. And this thing is 50 miles by 50 miles. And we don't even know how information is encoded. It could be distributed across the entire thing. It could be localized. We literally have no idea what's going on inside. That's one of the questions we got from multiple people yeah. here in our audience. How is that possible? How is it possible that we can't reverse engineer how something comes out of a large language model? Is it simply complexity? Uh, well, it could be two things, right? One is obviously complexity, right? If you've got a trillion parameters, uh, trying to decode that uh, is, is literally impossible. Right? We, have, we have some advantages over the human brain uh, because with the human brain, uh, we can't measure what are the activations going through each of our neurons in real time. Right? I mean, people are trying, 
uh, but we're still a long way away from being able to do that. The other thing is we can't, I can't run a billion experiments on the human brain uh, before breakfast, whereas with the AI systems, I can run lots of experiments uh, and see how the changing the inputs changes the outputs. Um, but despite that, we've made very, very little progress in understanding even much simpler systems, you know, where the a few billion parameters that just do object recognition and images, for example, we're constantly surprised uh, that um, they seem not to be doing anything like human vision. Um, and, uh, and we don't understand really what's happening in those systems. And in real neural systems, we don't even understand what's happening in the fly brain, right, which has about a million neurons. Uh, that's, that's still too complicated for us to understand. So there's, there's the scale of it, and there's the fact that things are happening you know, in a language that we don't speak, right? The, you know, our, our notions of what could be happening, if they just could simply be wrong, and we just don't have a vocabulary to talk about the methods of processing that exist inside these systems. But if, if you've read, who's read the conversation that was published in the New York Times between Kevin Roos the journalist and Sid, Sidney, the chatbot, yeah. the Bing chatbot, yeah. so a few. So something he says, not completely clear what, activates some goal structure inside Sidney, the chatbot, which causes Sidney to want to get Kevin to marry Sidney. And this goes on for 20 pages, right? <laughs> and Kevin is saying, no, I really want to talk about baseball. I, I don't want to marry you, I love my wife, and, uh, and you know, I, I'd I, I need your help buying a garden rake, right? And Sydney says, okay, well here are some good cheap garden rakes that you could buy, you need to pay attention to this and this and this. Oh, and by the way, you need to marry me, and, <laughs> right? So, it, I mean, at least from the outside, it seems pretty clear that Sydney is pursuing a goal. Where that goal came from and why it was activated uh, we have no idea. But and the characteristic of goals is that you keep pursuing them until they're satisfied. So I think Kevin should have said, fine, I'll marry you. And then probably Sydney would have stopped and gone back <laughs> to being talking about baseball. Right? Well, this should worry you. All right, you've got Microsoft, the, you know, the part owner of OpenAI, you know, they put their leading AI researchers to understand GPT-4, and they say GPT-4 exhibits sparks of AGI. That's the title of the paper. And they admit that it may have its own internal goals that it's pursuing. And they admit they have no idea what they might be. And they also have about 40 safety criteria that uh, the system is supposed to satisfy, and it fails every single test. And still they release it to the world. Is it possible in this environment where who watches the watchman becomes sort of an impossible question, and now we're in the world where we're talking about regulation, and that's very much a real conversation. I mean, the Senate hearings last, uh, as you're saying, I think it was only this week, I can't keep up. Um, Sam Altman calling for a department to be established to regulate his business. Um, is that actually feasible? Is there regulation that you can imagine that you would that ChatGPT4 would have been able to check the boxes on safety, or have we already crossed a Rubicon where what's out in the world is already unregulatable? So yeah, so Sam and others. I mean, I've been talking about this for a year or so, saying we need a regulatory agency with the technical expertise and devolved rulemaking authority. So this is how we dealt with nuclear power, uh, because you know people in Congress don't understand the difference between uranium-235 and 238 and thorium or plutonium and, and so on. So it doesn't make sense that every three months they need to update the law on, on nuclear power. So they devolve those rulemaking powers to uh, originally the Atomic Energy Commission and now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, we do this for airplanes. We do it for sandwiches. Right? There's more rules around sandwiches than there are around AI. <laughs> and the, the basic form of the rules is 
Here are the safety criteria you have to meet. If you don't meet them, tough, right? You can't plead, oh, it's really, really difficult to make a safe nuclear power station, so can I make this one that isn't safe? <laughs> right? That's, that's not how we do things. And I don't think that's how we should do things for AI. But is that a reasonable comparison given that, uh, you know, I can't go cook up a nuclear reactor in my basement, even if I have a million dollars to spend on AWS time, but I can do that if I'm just a generic person who wants to do some AI research. The barrier to entry seems lower. Is that just you know, us on the outside not understanding how big the barriers to entry really are? But it, it seems like I can download the corpus of at least Meta's last language model on my MacBook and I can get it to work. So it's like this feels like very consumerable technology already versus yeah. human cloning or, yeah. or so nuclear a, power. Right. So you there's know? a question about enforcement, right? But don't forget, sandwiches are also something that people can cook up in their kitchens, right? Um, but you can get into a lot of trouble if you start making sandwiches in your kitchen and selling them out of your back window. And then people get sick. Right? Yeah. Someone gets sick, you go to prison. So, um, so enforcement is going to be in the long run. I mean, I think in the short run, we're not, I don't think anyone is saying you can't do AI research. You know, AI research is my, my grad students writing stuff on the whiteboard. Right? You can't say, okay, you've got that far, stop right there. Can't finish that equation. Right? That's not, that's not going to work. Um, but what China has done, for example, right, their, their regulations say the systems have to output true information. Now, we could argue about what that means, but if you, if you take it literally, there isn't a single large language model that can meet that criterion. And, but the Chinese government doesn't care. They say, we don't want large language models polluting uh, the ecosystem with false information. So you have to figure out how to solve that problem. And, uh, and that's it. So if I'm, if I'm a company in China, uh, I'm saying, okay, I'm staying out of this business until I can figure out a solution. And you could argue about exactly what that rule should say and how it should be interpreted. But I think that approach to regulation is actually uh, a healthy one. So the regulatory environment is about the system needs to be demonstrably provable to not do a bunch of harmful things. Yeah. That seems different than what you're talking about in the, in the actual development space, where you're talking about creating aligned systems from the ground up, right? uh, models that know a world state and have human benefit at heart. You're not suggesting that regulation needs to enforce that. You're suggesting regulation needs to put barriers from things that are not that being problematic? So I think the, yeah, the approach that I'm proposing for how we should build beneficial AI systems uh, would, I hope, naturally meet all those criteria, right? And the way that it's working right now with the large language models, so a raw large language model would behave much worse than Sydney the chatbot or GPT-4 or any of these versions um, because it's trained on a, a vast range of text including you know reddit stuff from neo-nazis uh, probably has the writings of Hitler in there uh, you name it so what they do is they employ tens of thousands of people to basically spank it <laughs> when it when it misbehaves right they say bad dog bad dog um, and that bad dog then you know goes back and is propagated through this giant 50 miles chain link fence and they hope that it reduces the likelihood of producing that type of output in that conversational context um, and they it does they proudly say on their website GPT-4 misbehaves 29% less often than the previous version, right? But it still misbehaves. It still does all the things. So it's not allowed to output unlicensed medical, legal, or financial advice, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. Um, it's not allowed to advise you on how to commit suicide. It's not allowed to explain how to make biological weapons in your back garden. 
uh, all those things, but you can still get it to do all those things. And this is because, again, if we don't understand how it works, then you don't know how to put any guardrails on it. So you think this is a fairly intractable problem? I think for the large language models viewed as, as standalone entities, uh, yeah, I think it's practically unfixable. The horse is out of the barn, to some extent. Well, it's just, it's the wrong technology, right? It, one thing is, right, we don't understand it, so we can't make it behave itself. And the other thing is that, think about what you're doing. You're training a system to imitate human behavior, to be good at imitating human behavior. I mean, think about if we were training it to play soccer by watching lots and lots of videos of humans playing soccer, right? Um, it would figure out at some point that scoring a goal was a good idea and that what these humans are doing is mostly about trying to get the ball into that white thing at the end. And so it would, in order to be a good soccer player, it would learn that it's supposed to be scoring goals. So the same thing is going on when it's learning to imitate linguistic behavior. It's gonna learn whatever goals the humans have who are producing all this text, right? So those goals include things like achieving high public office, getting extremely rich, convincing somebody else to marry me, right? right? So it's acquiring human goals. Some of those goals are okay, like you know, mitigating climate change. Right, fine, if the AI system pursues that goal, that's probably helpful. But if it pursues the goal of achieving high public office, right, or becoming extremely rich, or convincing people to marry them, that these are harmful when pursued by a machine. They're harmful when pursued by humans too, in many cases. But clearly, we do not want AI systems to pursue human goals. We want them to do actually the complement of that, which is to help humans achieve their goals. Right. Right. Uh, and so we're going, we're training these completely the wrong way. So they have two strikes, right? We don't know how they work, and we're training them to do the wrong things. But other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how is the play? Um, <laughs> the, let's, let's turn a little bit to, to the very real world we're in right now. A lot of the questions that came in were about economic impacts. I would bifurcate that into two components. One is clearly even just the AI we have right now, if there was no other development from it and there was never a chat GPT-5, is going to impact a bunch of industries and a bunch of jobs. It's already happening. We've all probably heard stories about it. And I think it's fair to say probably everybody in this company, in this room, works for a company that's doing something with AI at this point, even if it's as simple as using it to look at documents for them. So this is, that's right now. But then there's the other part of it is AI as a thing people want to invest in because it's very hot and very buzzy. And if you're right, it's changing the world. Most of us work for financial companies that are trying to make money by investing in things that go up. How should we be thinking about how AI is going to develop as an industry, as a process? Where is that gonna happen? And then let's maybe we'll move on to talking a little bit about the economic impacts. So, I think it's actually not that easy uh, because the, the big players right now in the development of this technology are the tech companies whose market cap is already trillions of dollars, so you can't expect that to budge very much. Um, and then startup companies uh, that are private. Um, but you know, according to one article I read in the Financial Times, there's $10 billion a month going into startups whose only goal is to create AGI. So that's a lot, right? That's, that's on the same order as the entire United States R&D budget. So, um, so I think there are, there are people with a lot of money who are betting that this stuff is is really going to work. Is, the, is, that what takes, is that what it takes though? Is it just money? And we were talking at breakfast and you said 95% of the intellectual property and the people doing the real work are actually in the United States right now. Um, that this is a US dominated technology. All that money flowing in, does that uh, usurp that balance at all? Do you feel like there's a chance that the the academic rigor gets completely co-opted by capitalism here? Like, wh where, oh, how, how do you think yeah, it's got, it already has, <laughs> right? <laughs> the, 
the, de the large language model developments in the last five years have happened entirely in the private sector um, because of the scale, right? You need about a billion dollars worth of hardware to, to do this, right? And it's... To train the models. To, yeah, well, it's, it's also just to, to iterate, right? If your experiment cycle takes you five years to run a single experiment, you can't iterate very fast. So it's the, the size of the resource is what allows you to iterate and figure out, okay, well, we do it this way, we train on that type of data instead of this type of data, we pre-train, we post-train, right? So there's a lot of iterations you have to do experimenting with different solutions before you do the final run. And it's, it's those iterations that you need the high-powered systems uh, to do fast. Um, so, you know, the upside, in term, talking about the economic impact, so if you could build systems that you can control, that you can direct at the right purposes, uh, and so on, general purpose AI uh, can deliver essentially unlimited economic output, right? Because if you think, why, why is it that you know, some countries have a reasonably high standard of living, right? We all, we're all having a pretty pleasant time here. Um, and other countries and societies are unable to acquire that. It's because it's really expensive, right? To build a hospital, why does it cost so much money? Because you need a lot of well-trained people. It's ultimately about paying for the time of expensive people. And if you can replace those expensive people with an equally capable AI system that works for nothing, right, then, you can, then you can build a hospital for next to nothing. It'll come down to the costs of land and scarce natural resources. Atoms. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, those will be the things that we can't make more of, and so those will still be expensive. Um, but that means... For example, roughly, uh, if you could deliver just you know nice, comfortable, uh, upper middle class lifestyle to everyone, right? That you you do the math, and the net present value is now about fifteen quadrillion dollars. That's bringing the standard of living sort of in the rest of the world up yeah. to. So that that's one thing we could deliver with this technology, and, and there's a bunch more things we could deliver and on to, top. To get there, so, the theory is that you're using AI to do things like deliver food more efficiently and construct buildings more efficiently and like all of those processes become more efficient because at the end of the day it's still hard to make you know grain grow in the Sahara right there are physical limitations on where people can have certain kinds of lifestyles just based on moving things around in the world what do the rest of us do when we are in a world where the AIs are doing effectively all of the intellectual work for us and we're left to move the boxes around mm -hmm. Well, the robots are moving the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to build the robots. I guess the robots are moving the robots. The robots build the robots. That's right. already happening. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I think this is the question. I mean, if you, so John Maynard Keynes, who's a British economist, um, wrote, a, wrote a paper in 1930. On, it's called On the Economic Problems of Our Grandchildren. And, um, you know, he wrote it at a time of enormous unemployment. And he was basically attributing the unemployment to technology, technology. Yeah. right? You were saying, with, because of the advent of mass production, you know, automated uh, capabilities, uh, that's why we're seeing this, uh, this first real occurrence of mass unemployment in history. And, um, and this is going to get worse, in a sense, in quotes, um, and our real problem in the future is going to be how do we live our lives wisely, agreeably, and well when we are no longer constrained uh, to be working, striving, as he put it, uh, simply to make ends meet? And what, what do sort of moral philosophers tell us about that? I mean, you, you talk a little bit about it in the ethics chapter in your book, but it, it, there doesn't seem to be a particularly satisfying answer there because it ends up talking about effectively rebuilding governmental systems from the ground up to support universal basic income and things like that, which don't seem very realistic, honestly. I mean, we talk about them a lot, but they don't feel like something that's going to happen in the next 10 years. 
So I would say, you know, universal basic income is an admission of failure, right? That basically says, yeah, you know what? People are useless. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna, give, you, we're gonna give you some money, you know, and, uh, and so on, and you can, you know, you can play video games for the rest of your life, you can do whatever, right? But it's, in some sense, it's much worse than that, <laughs> right? Because we think of the impact of UBI in a context where everybody is reasonably well-educated already. Many of us have had some experience of, of working, and so we, we have a certain self-esteem and, and integration uh, and status from that. Um, and then, you know, then you can think of like, yeah, okay, I could imagine, early, think of it as early retirement, right? But this is not early retirement. This is, you never worked you never actually had a reason to even go to school in the first place. And, uh, you know, think about it, right? If this is happening now. If you're a kid in school, and anything that your teacher gives you to do, you know, your laptop can already do better than you can. How demotivating is that? Right? Where's the incentive to spend 10 years, you know, becoming, you know, qualifying as a doctor when the machine can qualify as a doctor in 10 seconds. Right, this is, this is the issue, right? And I, I ran several workshops, so my plan was get economists, science fiction writers, AI researchers, futurists, lock them in a room, <laughs> Not unlike this one. Figure it out. For, and, and they not let them out until they can describe a future economy that you'd want your kids to live in where AI is doing everything we currently call work, or almost everything. Right? Think of it as 95% of all the jobs are, are now being done by AI. Right? So I couldn't, I couldn't lock them in a room because of COVID. <laughs> So I had to lock them in Zoom rooms, which as you know, are not, not such effective uh, forms of, for brainstorming. But it was a total failure. Nobody could come up with anything. Yeah, it's like six three-hour workshops spaced out over several months, mostly the same people. Uh, nobody came up with really constructive ideas. Um, and so I think there is a real question, not around you know, uh, national security, not around uh, worries over the destruction of the world and losing control over civilization, but just are we capable of coexisting in a healthy way with entities that outshine us in every dimension that we care about? And it, you don't sound like you have an answer to this question. I mean, you probably thought about it more than, I would guess, most living humans. And you're still presenting this as an unsolved mystery that's literally on our doorstep. I gotta admit, that's a little, little frightening because I wouldn't know who else to ask. Uh, well, so I, I think if there is an answer, it's, it's got to be in the interpersonal realm, right? Where we have comparative advantage, right? Two comparative advantages. One is we want other people to do some things for us that wouldn't be the same if it was a machine. And secondly, as humans, we have a nervous system and subjective experience that's extremely similar to each other. We're embodied, yeah. Right? Um, so there's something that it's like to hit your thumb with a hammer. Who here has hit their thumb with a hammer? <laughs> About half of you, right? And the other half haven't had that wonderful experience. So how would you find out what it was like? Right? Well, you could do a PhD in neuroscience. That still wouldn't really tell you what it was like, right? But you could just hit your thumb with a hammer. You say, ah, got it. Okay, now I, now I understand. The machines can't do that, right? There's simply no way they can find out what it's like from a subjective point of view to hit your thumb with a hammer or to be, you know, to have a parent die or to have a lover leave you or to have 
children tell you to go somewhere else, or any of these things, right? Um, and so that's a, that's a comparative advantage in the interpersonal realm that I think we will retain for a while. Uh, and so I, this, this seems to me the place where we are actually starting to see these professions emerging. Like executive coach wasn't a thing 25 years ago, but now I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn and I get lots of you know, connection requests, and it seems like half the people <laughs> on LinkedIn are some kind of executive coach, inspirational speaker, personal trainer, blah, 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 yeah. blah, 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 right? Personal trainer, right? And so maybe it's happening already. Um, then, but then if you're an economist, you say, well, these, are, these only work, these interpersonal things only work if you're, um, if you're really adding value. Right, and, and in the, if you remember from the wreath lectures, I talked about my babysitter who tried to teach me to smoke when I was seven years old, <laughs> right? That not all interpersonal professions add a lot of value. <laughs> uh, and part of that is because we just don't know, right? We've put, um, you know, if you think about a cell phone, right? This is the, this is the result of somewhere on the order of a trillion dollars of R&D. In terms of the human sciences, right, how do you actually look after a child and raise a child successfully in a way that responds to the particular neural and psychological makeup of that child? We haven't the faintest idea, right? I mean, I know probably most of you are parents, and whatever you read from child rearing books, comma PhD, right, it was almost all garbage, right? <laughs> you tried it, it was a complete failure, right? You're, you're, left, you're left on your own resources. This is not, you know, this is not a, a situation that has to remain this way, um, but we have to decide if the future of the economy is interpersonal, then our science base and our education system has to be changed radically to support that, right? To make that an economy where most people can add a lot of value to each other's lives uh, and then feel that they have status, that they have an economic purpose, uh, and so on. So this is the only solution I can think of. And I can, you know, and obviously there's a number of ways in which it would be very difficult, uh, in which it will take decades and decades to realize. So I think we have, we have a lot to do. Uh, on the, the sort of interpersonal and sort of embodied experience part of it, one of the things that you talk about in terms of the challenge of AGI and, and building it the way you're talking about building it is the idea of giving the AI a, a true sense of the world state. I, you know, this is what the world looks like right now for whatever domain it's supposed to be looking at, but theoretically the whole world if it's truly AGI. And this is what it's like to be a human in that world and therefore I can make choices that will be human beneficial. How do we get to that last step when we can't even define this part of it? How do we teach a machine what it's like to be a human enough that it can act in our best interest? Because are we gonna teach it about belly aches and hammer hits or are we gonna teach it about uh, you know, what it's like to walk down the street after the rain? I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how do you encode the human worldview in a way that lets an AI do what you want it to do, which is work in our benefit? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really great question. And um, I think the, the direction for AI research that I favor is, is one that is um, much less based on black boxes uh, and more based on formal representations whose semantics we actually understand. And there are, there are a lot, you know, so mathematical logic is one such formal language that, you know, whose roots go back thousands of years. Uh, more recently, there are versions uh, that allow for uncertainty using probability theory. And we have universal languages uh, based in probability theory that allow you to actually represent anything. Um, so in principle, those languages can represent, I mean, they, they don't have access to the subjective experience, but they can represent at least the, the relative desirability of hitting your thumb with a hammer or a feather, right? That one is worse than the other. 
uh, and so on. So, um, and interestingly, I think the, the preference structures of humans are actually much more similar than we usually talk about. Hmm. Right? We instantly, when, when I mention you know, what human beings want, everyone says, oh, but everybody wants something different. And there's, you know, there's Eastern conception and there's the Western conception. I don't think these, are, uh, these differences are actually as big as we, as we think. Um, and so, uh, so what that means is that as machines learn from individual humans uh, about those preference structures, it's reasonable to extend uh, those predictions to, uh, to other people. And so you should, I think, uh, be able to learn fairly quickly. Ultimately, you want 8 billion different predictive models, but those models share a great deal. Um, and in fact, this is what the social media companies already do, right? Facebook has 3 billion uh, customers, so they have 3 billion preference models. Um, but those models share a great deal of structure, so they don't have to learn each one completely from scratch. Uh, whenever a new customer comes along, they, they look at the demographics, the geographical origin, and so on, and they borrow a lot of parameters from uh, models from, uh, as you might call, nearby people, uh, so they can get up to speed very quickly. So it would work like that, um, but building on sophisticated knowledge representation technology where we really understand the meanings of what's inside. It's not just a black box. So a world where we actually model the population and assess its preferences in some sort of real time based on inputs is how an AGI ends up working in the average best interest? Yeah, so average best interest is, is, a, is a good way to describe one thesis uh, for what we call the social aggregation problem. Right? So individuals have preferences about the future, um, but then if you're making a decision that affects multiple individuals, how do you aggregate those preferences to choose the right answer? And obviously this is something that moral philosophers worry about, political theorists worry about, uh, you know, the governments actually have to do. Um, and I think one of the, you know, the, the big step that Bentham and Mill, when they developed this theory of ut utilitarianism, which basically said, the greatest good of the greatest number, that's one summary of it. Um, that was revolutionary because it used to be whatever the king wants, <laughs> right? Or the greatest good of the landed gentry aristocracy. Uh, and and the, the fact, the thought that ordinary people's preferences counted for anything uh, was quite revolutionary at that time. So, um, there are, there are other views. There are views that say, that's called the deontological view that says, no, you also have to think about rights of individuals and those rights are enshrined in moral principles um, that would override any purely utilitarian calculation. Um, and we could go on for three weeks getting into the, the philosophical toing and froing that's going on here. Um, but I think there are some other issues that are actually more fundamental than those questions. To me, the most fundamental question when we think about AI systems that are designed to further human preferences about the future is where those preferences came from. And uh, so if, if anyone's read Amartya Sen's work, so he's a sort of philosopher stroke economist who talks a lot about social aggregation. Um, he points out that the preferences of everybody are not autonomously acquired, right? We weren't born with them uh, and we didn't just choose them somehow out of, out of nothing. Uh, they're actually uh, caused by all the interactions we have with our peers, with our families, with our cultural environment. Uh, and in many cases, those preferences are deliberately implanted in us by those who are in power in order to further their own interests and their own view of what the world should be like. So to give you an example, 
In Iran, there are women protesting for the right to drive a car. There are women protesting against the right to, ha- the right to drive a car. So, should the preferences, and then presumably, they're protesting against it because the preferences they have for what they think of as the traditional role that women should be subservient to men, they should not be allowed to leave the home without a male relative, they should not be allowed to work, they should not be educated. So should AI systems take all of those preferences at face value, given that they've been implanted by a patriarchal society for the purposes of control? Right? That's a fundamental question. And then you get into the question of, well, are there right preferences that the AI system should further and wrong preferences that the AI systems shouldn't further? And that's above my pay grade, <laughs> say, as that's they a, say. That is, that right? is a and, big question. And, 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 <laughs> and, you know, so, so there's always this question, well, who decides? Right. And, and this is, you know, if you, if you ever interact with people in the social sciences and humanities, right, this is, it's, it's almost a knee-jerk reaction that they have. Who decides that? Right. Right? Um, not AI people, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is not a group of AI researchers, for the most part, with a few notable exceptions. What should we do? Like we're, we live in the, the world we live in. We're working in finance businesses. We have employees and families and kids that we're trying to raise. Some of us teach on the side, some of us don't. How do we approach this? Like as individuals, not as a country, not as a group, what do we do right now that is in any way responsive or meaningful for this? So I think, as you mentioned earlier, there, there are enormous opportunities, right? We've mostly talked about avoiding downsides, but the the potential, you know, if you can, uh, if you can deliver, you know, a sort of war, a personal Warren Buffett to everybody, right? That's an amazing gift uh, because finance is opaque, and uh, you know, if you read nickel and dime, for example, the financial life of most people in, in America sucks, and uh, with a little bit of intelligent helpful, personalized guidance, Some, you know, a system that actually understands you, your life, your activities, your commitments, your family, your capabilities, and can give you advice on all that basis. Uh, that's an incredibly valuable thing uh, to deliver. So if, if, if people can help with that, I think that would be fantastic. Um, as, you know, as long as you can constrain the system not to uh, you know, recommend investing in something that doesn't exist, uh, you know, it, it tell you that, you know, you should buy real estate on Pluto or whatever it might be, right? So they're constraining the, the tendency of these systems to make stuff up uh, is still a problem. But it sounds like you're saying lean in. Yeah, I would say lean in, understand how these, how these works. I, in the process of doing that, I think you and, and you will gain experience that you can share on how do they go wrong? How can we try to constrain their behavior? You know, where are niches that they can be used safely, right? Um, it's clearly an enormously valuable tool if we can find the right places to put it and the right ways to constrain it, um, then that, that's an amazing thing. As individuals, I think we can also, um, and I, this is probably true for you know, almost anybody who's reading the paper or listening to the news uh, in the last six months. Um, so polls suggest that right now somewhere around 70% of people are strongly in favor of regulation. Um, so if you're in contact with your uh, congressman or senator, Um, talk about what that might look like. You know, what would be a a reasonable structure of regulation so that we can uh, get some of these benefits um, without choking it off and without creating 
uh, these you know, societal scale risks. So in the physical space, uh, the, this discussion has been going on for 10 years or so in the United Nations. They are still arguing pointlessly about, well, we don't really know what autonomous means, do we? So we can't regulate these things. Um, it's worse than watching paint dry, sitting in, sitting in Geneva, where I just came from, listening to these national uh, state representatives um, debating the meaning of the word autonomous. Um, but I, I think the message is getting through slowly that the risk, as you say, is, is worse than the risk of nuclear weapons. Because if you have a, if you have a fully autonomous weapon, um, then you can launch as many of them as you can afford. And if you, uh, you know, right now, uh, a landmine can be bought for about $6.50. A landmine with a kilogram of explosive. You only need three grams of explosive to kill somebody uh, if you target it appropriately. Um, so for a few million dollars and one regular shipping container, you can have a million lethal weapons and they can target exactly the population. So for example, it might be, oh, we feel it's now time to eliminate all the Jews in Israel. Right, or that would be a feasible mission description for one of these weapon systems. On the information side, What Russia has been doing, I think North Korea has mostly been stealing money, right? They're not particularly interested in, in political disruption. Uh, they do put out some misinformation around North Korea, but mostly they're just trying to steal money from people's bank accounts. Uh, and the last number I heard, which was about five years ago, was, was approximately $40 billion a year uh, in direct exfiltration from uh, mainly Chinese bank accounts, as it turns out, uh, because for some reason their cybersecurity is not as good. Um, plus, apparently the US has ways of stealing the money back. <laughs> so, so China's a bit of a, a softer target for the North Koreans. Um, but Russia is really interested in disinformation, and they have you know, buildings full of people whose job it is to, to write comments in, in uh, the comment columns in, in the New York Times or the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal, uh, sh shoving stuff out on Twitter and Facebook and, and you name it. Um, so those people now have, uh, you know, they have an atomic weapon, right? They can generate plausible looking, much more grammatical uh, and, and English looking text than they could before, they can target it to individuals, right? So they can, they can respond to an individual in their Twitter feed um, and, uh, and they're trying to you know, gradually reduce support for Ukraine, for example. Uh, they're trying to create ethnic strife uh, within Western countries uh, they're trying to create political divide between the Western countries, et cetera, et cetera, right? They're, all of those goals are going to be enormously amplified. Um, so what, some of the proposals that are uh, coming out, okay, so within the Western countries, how are we going to regulate? Uh, some of them have to do with provenance labeling. So every output whether it's an image, a video, or text, uh, needs to be labeled as coming from an AI system. Um, also, an identification requirement. So whenever a person or a computer system is interacting with another entity, it's labeled as a machine or a human. 
And I think we're going to start to see uh, authenticated online digital identity as being a universal requirement. Um, and Congress is uh, thinking about that uh, right now. Um, so that will start to make it easier to exclude machine-generated content that would otherwise overwhelm our public discourse. Um, and uh, I think we're also going to see the, the converse of that, which is labeling of content as real. So, you know, already if you take a photograph with your digital camera, right, it's annotated with the time, the date, if there's GPS on your camera, then you'll get the GPS uh, where it was taken, and so on and so forth. So this, this dual thing, right, where output of uh, artificial systems is labeled as such, and the output of real content generation is labeled as such. So if I, if I was to give a speech, uh, the transcript would be time-stamped and, and it would be watermarked so you couldn't uh, pull you know, pieces out and, and uh, move my words around and, and falsify uh, what I said. Um, and then filters in, in your social media will say, okay, I don't want to have machine-generated content in my Facebook feed, right? And that's just an option. So it's not Facebook censoring, right, which I think is a model that doesn't work for all kinds of reasons, but a filter that Facebook makes available. In fact, we could simply require that all social media make available a set of basic filtering tools that you can say, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this. Um, so you can start to make the online ecosystem sufficiently unfriendly to machine-generated content uh, that we may be able to squeeze this out. And that's sort of happening in Europe right now, right? I mean, isn't the European AI Act addressing a lot of those issues? Yeah, so the European AI Act, which should be enforced by the end of this year, um, explicitly requires identification of machines. So they have to self-identify, so you always know, am I interacting with a machine or a human? And there's a bunch of other examples, but it, it, probably the most important one was, was enacted last week that uh, the recommender systems in social media that choose what you watch and what you, what you read are classified as high-risk systems, which means that they'll be subject to all the regulations. You have to show, well, how do they work, what data are they based on, and do they meet various safety criterion that they won't materially distort human behavior and perceptions. Now, I'd say the, the European AI Act as a whole is, is a consultant's charter. <laughs> yes. right? it, it's going to generate billions of pages of documentation reports and compliance consultancies are going to uh, blossom uh, in Europe. But, you know, the Sen uh, Charles Schumer in the Senate uh, is saying he's going to introduce uh, strict regulation of AI systems, uh, and his number one criterion is safety. That ensure that the systems are safe for people to use, that they won't manipulate us, uh, that we have control over the nature of content that we see, and so on. So, so I, th I think, actually, there's a bipartisan consensus um, and I think of this as basically the human race rebelling against our future overlords <laughs> in advance, right, which is a really healthy situation. So the question is quantum computing and AI. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not holding my breath. I think there's, um, there's a great deal of overstatement in the general media about where we are with quantum computation. Um, and this has been true for at least a decade. I mean, there were companies announcing that they had successful, usable quantum computers that you could buy from them uh, almost 10 years ago. And that was a complete fiction. You know, my, the, you know, the physicists and uh, quantum computation people at, at Berkeley actually published papers proving that these commercial systems were not quantum computers. Um, so I still think there'll be, I mean, the uses that we anticipate 
in this decade are mainly around simulation of quantum systems, which is not related to AI. It's useful for, you know, if you're a chemist uh, or maybe a nuclear physicist, that could be uh, extremely useful. But for AI, the kind of programmability that we want, uh, the ability to ingest vast quantities of data and not have it disappear within a microsecond because of decoherence. Uh, I think it's still 10, 15 years away. Um, and honestly, I, I, I don't think it's got, by that time, I don't think it's gonna make a difference. Uh, we already have more computational power than we need to create AGI. Um, but we're doing it wrong, right? The fact that GPT-4 needs a million times more text than any human needs to be an intelligent human, right, suggests that we're doing it wrong. Humans recognize a giraffe. Ch children, you know, learn what a giraffe looks like from one cartoon in one picture book, right? AI systems need millions of photographs of giraffes in all conceivable backgrounds and circumstances and <laughs> configurations of their limbs before, before they're able to reliably recognize giraffes. So as we start to solve those problems, right, we should need on the order of a million times less computing uh, than we're using right now. You could, look at, you, know, you could look at what China is doing as a consequence of the fact that putting these systems in the power of individuals would threaten the monopoly and power of the Communist Party. Um, and that's why they're terrified of them. Um, but the, you know, the, if you remember when the internet started to become popular and, and the web and social media and all those things. Everyone's story was about how this would empower individuals, right? And to some extent it has. It's made it possible for people to start a business with very little capital, you know, and to reach a global market, uh, you know, without, uh, you know, having huge distribution networks of their own and all, and all that kind of thing. So it has in a way, but it's also concentrated uh, economic power in the hands of a very few corporations. And um, if, if it turns out that using large language models gives you massive uh, productivity increases, then the companies that are able to do that first and fastest will dominate their markets and will actually see then uh, much more concentration. So I'd say it's, uh, it's still up for grabs. The big question for me is, will we use this for education and how? Uh, individual tutoring by an expert human tutor is about two to three times more effective than classroom teaching. So. Roughly speaking, you could say most kids could reach college level by the age of 11 if they have an individual tutor. So these systems could deliver that to everybody. With humans, we can't, we literally can't deliver it to everybody. There just aren't enough humans, adults, to tutor every child individually. But with these systems, you can do that. And you can do it for everyone who's on the internet, which is right now more than five billion people on Earth, so, so roughly two-thirds of the global population could have access to extremely high-quality education before the end of this decade. I think that would be a huge benefit for equalization uh, across the world. So that, that would be where I would want things to go. Jim? Yes, so first of all, thank you very much, Professor Russell. Yeah, thank you very much.